Hey guys, and a very warm welcome to you all. Thank you so much for joining us on this uh, uh, webinar on pelvic fractures. And uh, we've got an awesome faculty, I'll just tell you about in a second, but I deliberately picked, um, I deliberately picked three incredibly uh, uh, controversial topics, resuscitation, LC1 fractures, and elderly or oh, acetabular fractures in the older patient. Uh, these are all um, incredibly, uh, you know, different different centers do diff different things. And um, uh, different centers do different things. I'm just, uh, just sorting out my camera. Here it comes. There we go. <laughs> You've always got to have a bit of a clusterfuck at the beginning of a webinar. That's the rule. Um, those three topics, LC1 fractures, resuscitation, uh, geriatric acetabular fractures, all of them have incredible diversity of treatment. Different centers do different things. And that's why I picked those topics because it's just great to see what, what individual um, uh, experts do. So uh, the, um, yeah, you can say clusterfuck in public. Yeah, you can, you can, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so I got, uh, from from Vancouver, I've got Kelly Lefebvre talking about LC1. It's widely published in the in the in the in the, the topic. So if anyone knows the answer, she does. I've got Mezacharya talking about uh, from Bristol talking about resuscitation. And I've got Paul Culpin, my old buddy and wingman at Royal London, uh, talking about geriatric acetabular fractures. I'm not going to wait for eulogies. I'm going to start straight off with Mezacharya talking about resuscitation. Mez, thanks so much, mate. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, and thank you to the whole OrthoTub team for organizing uh, the webinar. Thanks very much for the invitation. So I'll spend the next um, 15 to 20 minutes just talking a little bit about um, managing severely uh, injured polytraumatized patient with a pelvic fracture and some of the priorities in resuscitation. So we'll start with the case because I think it highlights quite a lot of the um, decision-making uh, and thought processes that we all face. So a 48-year-old male um, who was on his motorcycle um, early hours of the morning, he was hit by a drunk driver. He was thrown 50 meters from the scene. And what we're gonna do over the next few slides is just talk a little bit about his physiology and uh, some of the interventions that he had. So it was 4 a.m. in the morning, uh, the paramedics got to him um, at the scene they gave him some fluids, um, gave him some tranexamic acid and put a binder on. His initial parameters were a lactate of uh, over 12 and a systolic blood pressure of 80. 39 minutes later, he got into our major trauma center, our unit. 10 minutes later, a massive transfusion protocol was started. Nine minutes later, he had a left left-sided chest strain for a tension hemoneumothorax, and then he crashed. So he arrested, um, he had a lactate at that time of about 11, systolic blood pressure of 75. They managed to get him back. And this is what his AP radiograph showed in resus. So you can appreciate the injury, he's got a, a severely injured pelvic ring, uh, more so on the left side than the right side, significant injury posteriorly and a significant injury anteriorly. So about um, 6 a.m. he goes to theatre for uh, an anterior external fixator uh, and for pelvic packing. And this is his, his scan. So he hasn't had a scan yet. He goes to the scanner once he's been to theatre um, for a pelvic X-fix and pelvic packs. And this, is, this just highlights one of the difficulties that we have managing pelvic ring injuries with an anterior external fixator. So we can see that one of the pins or two of the pins may have missed. You can see what's happening to the posterior part of the pelvis and you can see these swabs packed in there, jam packed in there. You can see there's an injury to the opposite side as well. Further cuts through his CT, again, just showing the severity of the injury and the fact that the um, anterior X-fix doesn't really control the posterior pelvic ring. And so, you know, we've got to do something else. And what else can we do? Well, there are various options. Um, 
But one of the things you can do is think about stabilizing that posterior pelvic ring. And, that, and that's what happened. So at about seven o'clock, um, um, we get the call uh, and I'll go in and put some emergency iliosacral screws in to stabilize this posterior pelvic ring. And for the first time um, uh, during his resuscitation phase, does his blood pressure come up to about 100? And this is what happens to him over the next uh, four to six hours. So gradually his blood pressure comes up um, uh, to about 115 and his lactate over the next few hours goes, um, uh, comes back uh, to normal. So what this, this just shows that this is him three years down the line and he survived. Um, and what this shows is that actually a coordinated approach can improve or change um, whether this person survives or not. I put this up because I think everyone who looks at this picture, this image, will be concerned. They'll be, they'll be scared. They're, they won't know when to start uh, or where to start managing this patient. And what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is hopefully give you um, an algorithm which ensures that you um, tackle each and every step in a stepwise manner without missing anything. OK. Mortality in the UK. Well, if we look at this, this paper from 2007, Gene Udis, um, he showed that there was a mortality uh, of about 15 percent. And there was a um, there were two peaks. So there's a bi biphasic or bimodal distribution. And the first peak we can't do anything about. So these are the guys who are severely injured, um, who bleed out on the scene and we can't do anything about. The second peak, which is a bigger peak, we can do something about. And these are the guys who um, um, uh, die from systemic inflammatory response syndrome, so SIRS. And we can do something about that to try and prevent that happening or minimize the hit from that. And so what are the advances in treatment? Well, you know, we've, we've created major trauma centers, major trauma networks, and this has worked. You know, 20 to 30 percent of patients um, are, uh, uh, are surviving major trauma, which is, which is much, uh, 20, 30% more patients are surviving major trauma, which is fantastic. What are the advances? Why, why has this um, occurred? Well, it's rapid provisional stabilization and it's damage control resuscitation, getting the right patient to the right place so that they can have the right treatment. So what's damage control resuscitation? Well, not in this particular case, but in general, it's permissive hypotension it's hemostatic resuscitation. So these guys have lost blood and what they need early is blood. And then damage control surgery. Is there something we can do as surgeons um, or as interventionalists to try and help resuscitate these patients? And what do we want to do? Why do we want to do this? Well, what we want to try and avoid is the lethal triad. So the lethal triad of acidosis, coagulopathy and hypothermia. And we know that once patients get into this vicious cycle, it's a very quick spiral down and it's very, very difficult to come out of this cycle. So what I'm gonna do is, is, is just talk a little bit about ABC of pelvic trauma. And A stands for assessment, B is for binder, blood and blood product resuscitation. And then C, um, control of continued hemorrhage. So what do you do if the patient, after you've done all, uh, both A and B, they continue to bleed? Where, what do you do? Where do you go with them? So as I said, A for assessment. And it's really important. It's important you'll get information from the paramedics, et cetera, about the mechanism of injury. Um, these patients will be treated according to the ATLS guidelines, so life-threatening injuries. Um, will be picked up or should be picked up, managed. Look for various clinical signs, look for any associated injuries, and then think about your initial imaging. And what I really want to know from any pelvic radiograph is, is the answer to two questions, really. Is the patient stable? And is the pelvis stable? And if the answer to any of these questions, so either of these two questions, is, is no, then I know you're going to have to do something else, okay? You're going to have to do something else to create that stability or to stabilize that patient or that pelvis. So this is where we move on to B. So we've assessed the patient. We've decided that um, 
that they're unstable from a pelvic uh, fracture point of view or a hemodynamic point of view. And so we're moving on to, to B. And, and what's B? Well, B is application of a binder, bony stabilization, and there's very, various ways of stabilizing the bony pelvis, and blood and blood product resuscitation. So in our, in our um, um, unit, in our region, anyone with um, high energy blunt trauma and a systolic BP of less than 110 gets a pelvic, blunt, gets a pelvic binder. And, it, and the pelvic binder is there to, to mechanically stabilize that pelvis um, and protect the clot. That's what it does, okay? And there's various ways of stabilizing the pelvis. Are there any dangers of pelvic binders? Well, yes, they are, but, but, but actually in this emergency situation, pelvic binders are gonna save lives. Um, they're temporary and they need to be taken off as, as soon as it's safe uh, and possible. This is an interesting chap. So this is a, a, a guy in his um, mid thirties, came off his motorbike um, uh, at about 11 o'clock uh, in the evening at night. And so he comes in, he's got a splenic injury, he's hemodynamically unstable, he's got an open forearm fracture. So he's got a binder on, he's got a pelvic um, x-ray, which looks pretty benign. But it, it's important to look at everything. So look at the soft tissues, look at the shape of the bladder. Is the bladder usually that shape? And it isn't. So something in there is, is squeezing that bladder um, together. And so he has a binder off x-ray. And you see that the, the, the whoops, the, the symphysis opens up just a little bit there. The bladder changes shape and it develops these horns. This is the devil, okay? There's something going on. And those of you that are pretty astute can see that there's possibly something going on there. So he goes to theater, um, has an emergency uh, splenectomy uh, for his bleeding spleen. And these are his images in x-ray. So I haven't, I haven't stressed his pelvis at all. He's under a general anesthetic. He's had a, a, a mini laparotomy uh, to have his spleen taken out. And, and, and this is me just, just taking some images of his pelvis. So what that goes to show is that we, there is a, a risk of underestimating these injuries. And what we did is we looked at a cohort of our patients and we found that in 7% of cases, if you take a binder off x-ray, you will pick up um, significant injuries in 7% of cases. Um, this can be the typical uh, amount of resuscitation that a pelvic uh, patient needs. And it's important to realize that uh, these patients are, are pretty, pretty sick. Um, the National Patient Safety Authority said that anyone dealing with um, severe hemorrhage needs a, a, a massive transfusion protocol. Uh, and, and certainly most massive transfusion protocols are, are based on a one-to-one -one ratio. And this goes back to the military setting. Uh, and this is where the evidence is, is, is or has come from, is that it, it confers uh, a, an improved survival if you give them a one-to-one -one ratio of FFP to, to red blood cells. The CRASH-2 trials, there's some evidence again, uh, again uh, for giving tranexamic acid. Uh, one gram of tranexamic acid within three hours of the injury um, does reduce the mortality rate. It gives a 15% survival advantage. But it's important that this must be given as early as possible. So hence the paramedics who are first on the scene, they should be the guys giving it. Because the earlier it's given, um, the improved, uh, improved survival is greater. Okay. So we've, we've assessed this gentleman, um, we've decided that he needs something else. So we've moved on to B, uh, binder, bony stabilization, and blood product resuscitation, but he's still not responding. What do we do with the guy who keeps bleeding? We've got to move on to C, okay? And this, um, really, there are, there are two options here, or two main options. One is to think about taking him to the angio suite for uh, embolization. Uh, or the other option is to take the patient to theater uh, for stabilization of his pelvis uh, and pelvic packing. And, you know, you can look at these uh, as, as two distinct pathways, but 
what I would suggest to you is, is, is to think of these as complementary pathways. So you start off here in the middle with this patient who has this injury and who has a severely um, injured pelvic uh, um, injury who's bleeding. Um, you may, in your department, end up taking him to the angio suite. In other departments, he may well end up going to theatre. But it's important to remember that just because he goes to theatre doesn't mean he can't go to the angio suite thereafter or vice versa. And that's what I mean about complementary treatments. It's important to also understand and realise that angiography um, will only pick up about 15, 20 percent um, uh, uh, of arterial bleeders. Um, or sorry, angiography uh, will pick up bleeders, but only 15 to 20 percent um, uh, are actually arterial. Um, and it's important to remember that these patients may be shocked, so you may not see this, this classic blush sign. And when thinking of pelvic packing, it's important to, to understand that the pelvis needs to be stabilized. Um, it can be stabilized with a, with a pelvic binder applied a little bit lower um, than normal. Um, you can think about stabilizing the pelvis with an anterior external fixator. Um, or you can think about other means of stabilization, so with a C-clamp, et cetera. But it's important to stabilize the, the, the bony pelvis. And then in the polytrauma situation, it's usually a midline laparotomy because you're not um, uh, entirely sure whether the bleeding is only coming from the pelvis or whether there are other sources of bleeding as well. Um, and, and, and what you want to try and do is to pack as many large abdominal gauzes um, towards the posterior part of the pelvis, just anterior to the SI joint, the presacral place. So in summary, um, the mortality from these pelvic fractures is high. We have demonstrated, certainly in the UK, that with a, with a coordinated, systematic, multidisciplinary approach, getting the right patient to the right place at the right time so that they can be treated by the right team, does improve survival. And I think an easy way of remembering what we should do and how we should manage these patients is to think about the ABC algorithm. So A for assessment, B for binder, blood, and blood product resuscitation, and then C, what to do with those patients who continue to bleed and how we manage this continuous hemorrhage. Thank you. Mace, that was beautiful. Thanks very much, Mace. Uh, Mike, can you bring the uh, can you bring the other panelists in, uh, uh, just so, so we're all on screen? Um, so, Mace, a, a great question from. So, guys, just before we start, um, the Q and A is the place to place questions. So, if you if you want to stick uh, uh, questions up, please do in the Q and A. Uh, there's a really nice one for a guy called John John Wilson, who is basically asking about this X-ray out of binder thing. And I, I, Kelly, I, I, I'm interested to hear your take on this in just a sec. But uh, Mez, first to you, you've got you've got that kind of grey area. Yes, it was a high energy mechanism of injury. They came off their motorbike or whatever, and they've been through CT, and there's nothing to see on the CT, and they're not painful around their pelvis. There's you know. What I guess what I'm asking is, does a good secondary or tertiary survey make up for, or is it a good substitute for uh, an X-ray out of binder? Yeah, a great question. So I think it helps. Um, I think, uh, is it a good substitute? I think it's a, um, a good addition. Um, because the problem is, is that uh, with polytraumatized patients, sometimes there can be distracting injuries. And so you've got a patient who's, you know, who's got a, a, an open femur, maybe who's got a, a, um, a head injury, et cetera. And so there may be distracting injuries that when you try to assess the pelvis, they may not respond in the normal way. And so I think, I think assessment um, of the pelvis um, and the patient can be helpful, but I think you may still miss some injuries. Great. Kelly, can I can I hit you with that one? Is is it in sure. Canada, North America? Are you guys doing routine X-rays out of binder once in high energy injuries? Well, I won't speak for all of North America, but um, oh, no, I'm, I'm sticking you with a whole continent. <laughs> yes, there you go. With to stick me with the Americans. 
Um, so what I would say is the CT scan provides lots of additional information beyond just bony fractures or malalignment in the joints in the pelvis. So I think in a significantly injured patient, there's other clues of occult injuries, including hematoma and, pel and bleeding around the pelvis. So in absence of any other indication that there's an injury, if the patient has a normal, completely normal CT scan in the binder without significant pelvic hematoma, then we don't do that as a routine. Right. Uh, we recently had an interesting case where uh, the CT was out of binder and it looked absolutely plumb normal. And then uh, the x-ray out of binder uh, showed that it was open. So that, that thing of the gantry, the dish of the CT, uh, there, there was, I, I always used to think it was a myth that that, that could close up a pelvis, but it did, did actually seem to, or whether they're just wearing their trousers too tight, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it, uh, uh, the, the CT was, was normal and the x-ray out of binder, was extra, the subsequent x-ray was not. Um, C clamps. Any got any of you guys use a C clamp? Mez, you ever you ever you ever fired up a C clamp from Bristol? <laughs> so you know we went through a um, uh, a time where we had quite a lot of uh, patients who needed pelvic packing, and and uh, <coughs> one or two years where we were we were going in and packing quite a few pelvises, um, and so we thought, look, we, this is one thing we don't have on our shelf. We don't have a C clamp. And so we need to invest in one. And so uh, we were quite fortunate. We had a bit of spare cash, uh, which was donated to the orthopedic department. And so we ended up getting a C-clamp. Um, and have we physically taken it out of the box to use on a patient? <laughs> and the honest oh, answer... Man, I bet holding no. it just feels awesome. <laughs> it must feel like just like the man holding it. Like, the yeah. power, the power, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but the power has not uh, needed to be used. Not been yielded, yeah. Uh, Paul, can I can I ask you about soft tissue? Like I may have showed a cracking open pelvis there, um, uh, where, where of course a binder. You know, you can't use a binder in an open situation. What's what's your approach to when you see a patient with a big perineal wound? Like not not maybe not an iliac wound, but one that goes down either towards or involving the anus. What's your sort of uh, approach to that? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the same principles apply, right? We've got to get some stability still into this ring. Um, and so clearly, I think a binder's superseded where we used to use an X-fix or even a C-clamp. So I think the last question, I think the reason we don't use a, use a C-clamps, they're, they're pretty historical. And that control of the posterior ring, we achieve it good enough, I think, in a temporizing measure from, from a binder. Now, in your hideous open fracture, the soft tissues are the priority, but you need to have some form of stability. Um, so I think that's one of the few occasions where we're using an external fixator to, to deliver on that, or perhaps an infix. Um, so uh, an infix, I think, offers a, an elegant solution for that. But you need to have access to, to, to wash out those wounds, examine them properly, um, and do this as a combined case with your general surgeons, because very, very often um, you're, you're, you're looking to defunction the, the colon um, and do everything you can against infection because that's the, the overriding enemy in the open pelvic fracture. Yeah. Kelly, how does your decision making go as to colostomy versus you know, defunction versus non? Do you have like an algorithm in Vancouver or is it, is it just whoever, whoever's on? Well, we do. I, we have an ongoing discussion about it. And true to your tone question, I imagine I'm not alone in thinking that there can be some controversy about defunctioning colostomy versus some of the new wound irrigation methods that allow management of these open wounds that the general surgeons favor at times. Um, we as a group strongly favor diverting colostomy whenever possible um, because there's a very real um, additional factor of infection, deep infection involving pelvic hardware, and also patient mobility in managing those wounds. This is not a, a simple open wound. It's an open wound attached to a significant pelvic fracture. So for the patient to go through um, the wound management that, that's required without a diverting colostomy is really difficult for patients. So I remain a big fan of the diverting colostomy. Mez, are you a diverter or, or do you tend to avoid it or where what, do what you sit on that? Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, I'm um, a proponent of uh, diverting. I think the important thing about um, the colostomies are that you need to be there when they're citing them because if you leave it to a registrar or someone who doesn't do a lot of trauma, they'll classically want to place it quite low 
Um, so I think you've got to be there and you've got to make sure that they place it well out of the field um, and of, of any uh, subsequent approaches. Great. So I found that, that you've got to be there and tell them it has to be placed very high away from your subsequent approaches. Great. All right, thanks for that question, Andy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jagmeet Bamra is asking about uh, resuscitative, resuscitative parameters and are we using lactate or base excess or pH or what's, what's the best tool? I think I'll probably start on that one by saying that obviously there is a there is a myriad of tests you get and a lot of information is flying at you but essentially lactate is a very good measure of acidosis in the early few hours so lactate is a sharp tool at the start and then as time goes on it becomes an increasingly blunt tool because you get other factors coming in like systemic inflammatory response and sympathetic activity and other, you know and all your blood products going in etc so um, but at the beginning, when you're when you're trying to work out whether you're winning or losing, or whether you're a responder or transient or or or, or uh, partial responder, lactate is a useful tool in that setting. As time goes on, it becomes less to, less less useful. Is, is that fair to say, Mez? Would you say? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. I think there are um, uh, lactate is a is a great um, initial marker uh, which gives you an idea of resuscitation generally but the other thing that's really helpful um, uh, is is teg and rotem to give you an idea of where you may be behind in resuscitation and what you need to maybe give more of yeah understood uh, are you routinely using teg in uh, in vancouver kelly we certainly are in royal london we're routinely using Rotem. Our ICU and our um, anesthesia group is routinely using I guess. Yeah, yeah, fine. Um, uh, Paul, uh, well, so uh, Mez mentioned using shock screws. Paul, is, uh, you mentioned using an infix for like acute fixation. Have you ever found yourself you putting in putting in SI screw, screws acutely? It's definitely something people talk about. Yeah, yeah, I think it it is there for you to do, and I think it's it, it's. It's the best form of, of getting that stabilization stabilization at the back. And we saw in Mez's case, they put, put them in a temporary manner and he could fine tune them for the definitive fixation, which I think is, you know, absolutely fine. Um, but yeah, I think I think if there's an opportunity to put in your SI screws acutely, then then I'd take that opportunity every time. Yeah. Great. Uh, but the priority uh, also in these patients is resuscitation. You have to, you know, you have to get them stabilized and then get them out of theater and back to back to intensive to care for their for their parameters to improve. So it's a balancing act. You know, I think I think one uh, one has to accept that, that you're not the only player in that field. And um, and if your infix is giving you enough stabilization, then, you know, uh, if the opportunity is, is not there, then I'm very accepting of that. Uh, Sam Walters has asked an interesting question about, and you're experiencing in your experience managing polytraumatized patients. How often do they die directly as a result of the pelvic injury? Uh, how often do people die because of shock, purely because of the pelvis? My experience is it's it's actually pretty unusual nowadays. <clears throat> Good damage control resuscitation. Uh, patients tend to die of their head injury or their you know their severe combined abdominal and pelvic injuries rather than uh, pelvis alone. Even, you know, dump truck over pelvis often survives nowadays uh, just <laughs> through, through um, damage control resuscitation being more and more bought into the pre-hospital arena. Uh, would that be your experience, guys? Kelly, what's, what's your thoughts on that? I think that's true of my lens and my experience, but I think to be fair in the way course of care occurs, that there, there'd be a certain proportion of pelvic fracture patients that die before we become involved, right? Die on the field or die yeah. in the ED before we become involved. Uh, but once we get them to that decision-making time of angio versus packing and, and X fixes and early stabilization, I agree, it, it's become rare. Yeah, well, just just uh, tell us uh, for, for those guys in in the UK what um, what uh, your pre hospital guys are up to. What are, what are they allowed to do in the in the uh, pre hospital arena? Do you have physicians so, working, or is it mainly uh, uh, paramedics? No. So the difference in working in a place like Canada versus the UK is that we have a huge geographic expanse with relatively little population. So those factors about regionalized trauma centers and so on are even more important. Um, I would say that the most recent changes is that um, there's no longer a need to uh, stop at, re at smaller centers 
um, and they can bypass directly to, to the major trauma center. So we get patients coming in on helicopter that have come from hundreds of kilometers away that are being managed by the EMTs in the helicopter and are, are what they call auto launched our institution. There's no physicians in the field as a rule, uh, but they provide intubation, uh, pelvic binders and early resuscitation in the field. Uh, Mez, uh, just before we move on, any top tips for pelvic packing? Yeah, so, you know, um, I, I think if, you, if you're in that emergency situation, um, phone a friend. So if you're doing it for the first time, don't do it on your own. Um, phone a general surgeon. Um, they're more, much more used to doing a laparotomy uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and being there. So... So yeah, take a friend with you, take a vascular surgeon or a general surgeon um, and do it with them. Make sure that the pelvis is stabilized before you do that because the problem is, is you open someone up and you do a laparotomy and you haven't got bony stability and they could bleed out there in front of you and die. Um, third thing, uh, get some big abdominal packs. Um, a lot of the stripping will have already been done and you'll find it's easy to get these packs right in the back and try and pack as many as you can. Um, usually, just talking a little bit about uh, pelvic packing and what happens afterwards, so usually we try and bring them back uh, 24, 48 hours um, uh, back to theatre. And at that time, um, you know, they've been warmed up a bit more, they've been resuscitated, stabilised. Um, you can then think about changing the packs or taking out the packs and, and performing definitive uh, fixation and stabilization if possible. Cool. Uh, okay, we're gonna move on just a sec, but one more uh, from Jaji Key. Uh, how, do you have any tips for, uh, sorry, from um, uh, 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 David and TB. Uh, Paul, at what stage do you involve the urologist for urethral, urethral damage? Do you, are, you, are you one for getting urologists down to the ED or into the emergency theatre? Well, you know, our urologists are pretty loath to get involved is the reality. Um, so if a catheter is coming close to the bladder, we're not likely to see a urologist. That's, that's pretty much our experience of it. And I, I must say, I do find it strange. Um, but even when we're, invite, we're inviting them in, they, they tend not to do too much. And they're really not into doing anything acutely when it comes... <laughs> Uh, to reconstruct of our repair procedures. It, it, it's, maybe a, it's maybe a UK cultural thing because there's been a bit of a monopoly on, on very, very few urologists who have the experience and probably therefore the skill in reconstructing yeah. a ure urethral injury. Uh, but they tend to prefer to do this uh, down the line at sort of three months. So, so yeah, we, we don't have a great, look, a great support, a great deal of support from them. So um, uh, if if the catheterization fails, then then we will, of course, get them in to, 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 to help us with what will end up being a super pubic catheter, and then they'll come back later. So they don't like to get their hands dirty, at least in our institution. Kelly, are your, your urologist keen for realignment procedures or not really? <clears throat> not early realignment procedures, I'd agree. Um, they're helpful in getting access for bladder drainage and in dealing with acute uh, bladder injuries that require surgical treatment or require their input if we're doing an open anterior approach, but most of the reconstructive elements happen later. Yeah. Mess? Yeah, just two, two more points on, on urethral injury. So um, there are some great post guidelines um, on management of urethral injuries, and they're well worth a read. And secondly, going back to Kelly's point, yeah, having the urologist there, you know, and, and similarly to the colostomies, be there when they cite those suprapubics. Because again, traditionally they'll be low, and they'll be in your field if you if you want to do an anterior approach. So, so be there and ask them to put them as high, as high up as possible. Right, cheers, guys. Uh, Kelly, we're going to move on to you talking about LC1 fractures. Absolute minefield. Good luck. With that. <laughs> Great. I always get the good assignments. Uh, hang on one sec. Here we go. You see that? Okay. Perfect. Beautiful. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for the invitation. Um, greetings from the West Coast of Canada. And I, I was assigned today to talk to you about LC1 pelvic fractures and highlight where we are in 2021. I do have some disclosures, but none of which pertain directly to the topic we'll be discussing today. Um, oopsies. 
sorry, something happened there. So I'll we'll start with the case. This is a pretty typical case for us in Vancouver. We're directly adjacent to Whistler, which is a world-class ski resort, attracts um, a huge volume of visitors every year, and it creates a lot of trauma for us. Uh, this was a middle-aged gentleman who had a, a crash with another skier skiing out at the end of the day. And he suffered a pelvic ring injury that was apparent on the initial AP pelvis that he had bilateral anterior ring injuries that were pretty minimally displaced. And his axial CT scan showed that he had a complete sacral fracture, but the overall rotation, uh, rotational alignment of the pelvis looked pretty good. So what we'll try to work through today is what we're gonna do with this gentleman. So the objectives today are that we're gonna touch a bit on the history both of LC1 pelvic fractures and where we are overall in evidence-based medicine and pelvic fracture treatment. There's some important distinctions to highlight in LC1 pelvic fractures. And then we're gonna to get to why decision-making still remains hard. And that involves um, getting an in-depth look at the literature in the area. Finally, we'll get to the nuts and bolts of treatment. So what are the treatment algorithms that are available and what are the treatment options? And finally, we'll come to future research direction. So first, I think it's important to highlight that pelvic fractures that are bad enough to require surgical treatment have all kinds of long-term disability. And there's lots of different factors that drive this disability. Making studying the importance of different treatment methods, this type of screw versus that type of screw um, or surgical and non-surgical treatment makes the study of those things difficult. In our longitudinal study, we found that B fractures or rotationally stable fractures do better than C fractures, but at five years, both still have substantial disability compared to baseline. Historical literature in pelvic fractures is, is fairly low quality by today's standards. In this systematic review we did in 2012, we found that the overwhelming majority of papers uh, in surgical pelvic fractures use radiographic measurements as their primary outcome but they don't do a great job of it. They don't tell you how they're measuring this many millimeters versus that many millimeters of displacement. They don't test that measurement technique. And there certainly isn't a clear correlation between millimeters of displacement and functional outcome. We've looked more closely at this to test whether experts can actually do that. So if we're being told that five millimeters or 10 millimeters of displacement is really important, is that something that we can actually measure? And we found overall previously described techniques have pretty poor reliability with the possible exception of really simplistic methods in which it's essentially a single line of instruction. So there's no reference line, it's not multi-step. And with this method that gives you a ratio which is sort of hard to interpret based on our conventional language. Functional outcome reporting in pelvic fractures really isn't very different. It's been really varied, um, making comparison between various studies or knowing really how to best measure outcome in our patients difficult. So in a nutshell, the quality of evidence in pelvic fractures really is in its infancy. Um, and we're gonna need much higher quality evidence to really have uh, strict treatment guidelines. But we still need to do something with our patients. So we still need to move forward on what the best available information is so we can make a decision. The Young and Burgess classification, which is my personal favorite, uh, was described in the mid 80s. And they described a mechanistic classification of three main fracture subtypes. Lateral compression fractures are those in which the pelvis is infolded from the side. An LC1 fracture is where the compression failure occurs at the sacrum. LC2 fracture, it occurs at the ileum. And an LC3 is either one of those with an open book on the contralateral side or a windswept pelvis. The initial series of these really highlight how they've always been viewed, which is that they're fairly minor. You know, the posterior ligamentous structure is intact, the sacrotuberous and sacrospinous ligaments are intact. And in this initial series, the severity of injury in the sacrum was largely small, so buckle fractures or very minor injuries. But for those of us who run a modern day uh, trauma practice, we know that the spectrum of injury in real time is actually much greater than that. So some patients with lateral compression fractures actually have very high energy injuries. With this in mind, when I was a fellow with Adam Starr, we just wanted to kind of characterize that. So what is the spectrum of bony injuries? 
how do we categorize those? And how frequently um, is each subgroup occurring, both in the posterior ring and the anterior ring? And what we found is that um, we could essentially have three types of anterior sacral injury, either buckles, simple fracture lines at the front of the sacrum and the back of the sacrum, or more comminuted injuries. We called all of those that came through front to back, like our patients, complete sacral fractures. And in this study, we found that half of patients really have this complete sacral fracture, and that's predicted by ISS, zone two injuries, and abdominal injuries. So if we can agree that these higher energy lateral compression injuries are common, can we agree on how to treat them? And the short answer to that is no. So in this often cited uh, study where 27 cases of lateral compression injuries were sent to 111 OTA members. So these are trauma surgeons with a pelvis-based practice. They called consensus if more than 90% or less than 10% of respondents um, wanted to perform surgery so that the overwhelming majority agreed on that surgery was required or not. And that occurred only in a third of the cases. So only in those most significant and least significant injuries. So in the extremes, maybe treatment is, uh, is accepted if not proven, but there's a huge gray area in the middle in which it still remains very unclear what we should be doing. Heather Valier and Paul Ternetta um, have done a lot of work in this area. In 2019, they published this series of 333 patients from multiple centers with unilateral sacral injuries. The vast majority of these patients had LC1 fractures and a third of them were treated surgically. So with all of these decision makers involved, they look back at the radiographic markers that these patients had preoperatively to see if they could determine a pattern in which these decisions are being made. And essentially that pattern is not there. So seemingly fairly um, random decisions as to whether patients required surgery or not, highlighting the need for some kind of uh, development of consistent indications for treatment. This Bolville award-winning paper from Tornetta's group in 2019 looked at stability with early weight bearing. So they had 108 18 patients with LC1 pelvic fractures that were allowed to weight bear immediately. And they found that displacement, how they were measuring it, occurred almost never. So one out of 118 displaced and were converted to surgical management. Contrast that with this paper, which was an OTA highlight paper the following year. And they had 117 patients, which again were treated non-surgically. Uh, based on having less than five millimeters of initial displacement. And they found that a particular subtype, so those with complete sacral fractures and bilateral rami fractures, almost always displaced, or 68% of the time they displaced. So clearly, the evidence remains very conflicting. This study from 2014 took 50 patients that were in that gray area. So they had a complete sacral fracture, displaced less than a centimeter, they were all treated non-surgically and using the Majeed score, which can have some issues with sealing effect, um, they found that the overwhelming majority had excellent or good outcomes if they didn't have another lower extremity injury. So we can see from this review of the literature why consensus remains so difficult. The next major school of thought around lateral compression pelvic fractures came from Claude Saji and his group. So he's been a big proponent of examining patients under anesthetic. He describes a, a large series of maneuvers and fluoroscopic views um, in which he advises acting on any displacement of greater than a centimeter. So this invokes a lot of surgical treatment of pelvic fractures, um, but he cites 100% negative predictive values. So if you um, pass the EUA, then you don't have any late displacement. In 2018 with Hassan Mir, they've subsequently published a more involved algorithm for LC1 specifically, in which they talk about doing an EUA of the posterior pelvic ring. If there's displacement there, then they act on the instability in the posterior pelvic ring and repeat the EUA to look for displacement in the anterior pelvic ring and similarly address that if it's present. 
critics of the EUA algorithms, of which I would put myself in that camp, would say, well, what exactly are you measuring? If we can't reliably measure to within millimeters on a computer screen, can we do it with a moving pelvis on a fluoroscopy screen? How reliable is it? So can two people measure the same thing? And what, what's the, uh, why is a centimeter the cutoff? So is 11 millimeters bad and nine millimeters is okay? There's never been a demonstrated association uh, with final functional outcome. And then probably most importantly is to think about what the trade-offs are. So this is a resource intensive as far as cost and surgical time with a potential for complications, including neurologic complications from fixation of the posterior pelvic ring. One of the other main thoughts is around the impact of early surgery on pain and early mobility. In this study of 63 patients, they did EUA with the typical indications. And they had uh, significantly positive findings in the surgical or EUA positive group, better pain, faster mobilization, faster discharge by several days, and less opioids. So much so that they drew very strong conclusions recommending surgical treatment for patients with complete sacral fractures without EUA. Others have been unable to reproduce these results, however. So this study from the shock trauma group in 2016 took 158 patients, 51 operative, 107 propensity match non-operative patients, and they found no difference in pain scores or narcotic use, but a potential difference with faster mobilization. This study, again, uh, by Tornetta and Valier, they looked at 194 patients over 18 centers and looked at the visual analog score for pain um, in those unilateral sacral fractures treated with surgery versus no surgery. They had a statistically significant pain finding at 24 hours, but that didn't hold significance at the uh, later time points. And it was of, of what's been brought up as questionable clinical significance. So in the end, what we know is a lot less than what we don't know, but we know that this represents a huge spectrum of injury in which there's little or no consensus on treatment except at either uh, extreme end. Treatment still has an unclear impact on outcome, certainly functional outcome, but there are some potential benefits of surgery, including radiographic, early mobilization, and early pain control. Fragility fractures of the pelvis or low energy lateral compression pelvic fractures in older patients are certainly a different subgroup, which requires some consideration. Different spectrum of injury and different patient population uh, than younger, higher energy pelvic fracture patients. These have historically universally been treated non-surgically, but there certainly is proponents uh, that these are a different animal that requires special consideration. Raman's and his group, so much so that they've described a completely uh, different classification system for these injuries in which they would uh, support surgical management in almost all, or certainly almost all uh, that are not weight bearing three days after injury. The evidence in this area is limited, but this is a group that may actually really benefit from early uh, surgical stabilization. None of us would question if the patient uh, with the femoral neck fracture on the right or with the acetabulum fracture with significant protrusio on the left needs surgery, but whether this patient needs surgery uh, remains a major question. Although the risks of lack of mobility, including morbidity and mortality in this population, presumably is the same. If we do decide to operate on patients, surgical options include posterior fixation, anterior fixation, or a combination of the two. Percutaneous fixation really is, is the standard of care now in the posterior pelvic ring. And anterior fixation also can be percutaneous, can be more formal ORAF through an anterior approach, and a distraction X-fix or, or infix device as well. Mr. Bates asked me specifically to say what I do. So I would say my process is sort of a take on, on um, the scoring criteria as proposed by Beckman, in which they said anyone who scores seven to nine uh, should be considered for surgical stabilization. I don't know if I would put the bar that low, but I would agree that many of the factors described here, described here matter. 
So initial sacral displacement, location in the sacrum of the injury, how many columns are involved, and the relative displacement and location of injury in the anterior ring. I look at injury factors as well as patient factors. So displacement, radiographic markers uh, of instability. EUA is not a routine part of my protocol or our protocol at our center. Injury severity is an important um, factor. So whether this patient specifically because of chest injuries or other reasons may have a big mobility uh, benefit from surgical fixation. And we need to always be considering the overall morbidity of the trauma. And rarely there will be a patient who fails conservative management, whether that be uh, radiographically fails in a pronounced way or uh, failure to mobilize. Because I trained in Dallas, Texas in my hands, that's percutaneous whenever possible. Um, and if needed, the addition of an infix as a secondary option in the anterior pelvic ring. So with all that in mind, that first patient I showed you did have fixation of the posterior ring and not of the anterior ring because of the lack of displacement in the anterior ring. Um, we were aiming for early mobilization and he was having significant pain. He also had some overlap um, or displacement in the sacrum. So the takeaways are that this is a spectrum of injury, like we said. There lacks consensus in that important or very common middle area. Treatment has an unclear impact on outcome, um, but there are potential benefits of surgery. Evidence-based treatment in pelvises overall is still in its infancy, and I think we're gonna see lots of, of major studies published in the next five to 10 years. With that in mind, um, what uh, well, Dr. B or Mr. Bates could speak to this better than I could, but there are several RCTs looking at lateral compression pelvic fractures, which hopefully will have uh, data in this area in the coming years. The first is the uh, life study looking at patients older than 60 who failed to mobilize in the first 72 hours. They're randomly allocated to surgical treatment or non surgical treatment with quality of life and cost effectiveness as the primary outcome measures. And the TULIP study is looking at uh, adult patients with non-fragility fractures and complete sacral fractures, uh, similarly surgical versus non-surgical treatment, looking at functional outcome and cost effectiveness. So targeted really at that gray area, uh, middle group of patients. So more to come in this area. Well, thanks for your attention. And I'll finish with a blatant uh, plug for any trainees online here for our trauma fellowship program and what of course we think is the most beautiful city in the world so if anyone's looking for information please uh email me thanks that's awesome kelly thanks thanks very much great job uh well I, I, okay so i'm gonna hit you one of the killer conundrums in the lc1 uh, arena is the scenario is it's a high energy lc1 so someone's come off their, their motorbike or whatever and uh -huh. um they're going, to the, they're going to the operating room to have their proximal humerus fixed anyway. Mm -hmm. Now, this was an LC1 that you probably, under normal circumstances, would have treated non-operatively. But they're going to the OR anyway to have some other thing, their radio head done or their, some other thing. Does that change your position at all? Oh, I think so for sure. I mean, if you look at that patient overall, if they've got a high energy LC1, no matter what we tell them to do, they're going to have difficulty weight bearing substantially on that side. So if they've also got an upper extremity injury, then that's an added complexity to their mobility. So absolutely, that would be enough to push me over um, towards fixing it surgically to try to facilitate their mobilization. And would you, would you go for a, a cheeky EUA just out of interest at that point? Would that influence your decision-making or, or have you kind of made up your mind before you go in? I've made up my mind before I go in, but I, I do find EUA can, can provide some interesting additional information, like might influence whether you're willing to let the patient weight bear after fixation, if, if you think they're dramatically unstable. Um, so I think it's interesting. Like, I, I think that EUA information is additional information about the patient's stability, but I think we're not at the stage where we can really responsibly apply and measure specific cutoffs uh, to determine if patients should be treated surgically. Yeah. Mez, can you hit me with a bit of uh, what's, what would LC1s get in, in, in Bristol? 
<laughs> That'd be part of the tulip study. No. <laughs> no. Um, so, uh, you know, I agree with Kelly. I think um, it's, it's difficult, isn't it, when, you, when you've got a patient who's got two or three injuries and you're taking them to theatre for other injuries to, to, to say that this the pelvic ring should be treated non-operatively because it's the ideal opportunity to do something about it. I think the real... So, so if they were polytraumatised and they weren't part of a trial, um, we would probably have a low threshold for fixing them. Um, certainly, as, as Kelly said, if, they have, if they've got upper limb injuries um, or, or lower limb injuries, it doesn't really matter. I think it just helps their rehabilitation. Um, I think talking about uh, screening and EUA, I think where it's really, really useful is um, picking up the LC3s. So those who have um, a contralateral external rotation type injuries. And I think um, these... Um, can be missed. So I think it's really important to be vigilant about those. Yeah, totally agree with that. Mm. Uh, Paul, um, there's quite a few questions around the elderly, you know, the, the, the fragility, if you like, LC1. Uh, what's, what's your take on those? Is it, what, would, what would drive you to be fixing an LC1 or a minimally displaced LC2 in an older patient fall from standing height? Yeah. Um... Well, I think, I think Kelly's talks highlighted that it's a pretty confusing area, really, right? And, and there is no clarity. And um, so my personal practice is that I, I want to fix the ones that have that complete sacral fracture. They're the group that I kind of subcategorize. Um, and, and, and they're the ones that I'd be tending to go towards being more aggressive. Um, and I'd also have an eye on the on the anterior ring and the extent of the the extent of the injury pattern you're seeing there. Um, and I think that when you're seeing bilateral pubic rami fractures, again, it's a subgroup that you're just thinking there's more more of a probability of of, of, of a bit more instability here is likely to to compromise their their overall ability to get up and mobilize. And then there's those that don't progress. And so, so the trial of conservative management and then a few days, let, 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 you know, if you're really failing and it's pain and, it's, uh, and, it's, uh, and, and a clinical assessment, I think is helpful for this, then they're the ones I want to fix. Yeah. Can I ask you guys about, uh, there's always questions about weight bearing. We've got a couple of those going on uh, from Vishai. Um, what... So let's say you've, you've taken a, 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 an LC1 to theatre, to, to the OR, and you fixed it. Are we all agreed that that's getting immediate weight bearing as tolerated? I think the only setting in which that would not be the case is in the highest energy, you know, why Adam Starr wanted to do that study about the spectrum of injuries is he's a believer that there's often misclassification between vertical shear and high energy LC1. So if there's any question that the patient is vertically unstable, it's in that energy area, then I would say no. Uh, but if the diagnosis is really clear and the fixation is strong, I think patients do an excellent job of limiting themselves. Yeah. So if they're in too much pain, they're going to be offloading more. So I let them wait. There. So uh, just pick you up on that. So Mez mentioned about LC3s. So that's, that's a reason to EUA. If you're worried it might be an LC3, uh, masquerading as an LC1, then that's a good what you know, looking down the sacroiliac joint on the other side is helpful. What, how do you differentiate a, a nasty LC1 from a vertical shear? So I'm, I'm, um, you know, I think there's real life and then there's research quality and, and those are kind of two different things. I think that with EUA, we can make broad determinations like the patient has an SI joint that opens on the other side or not. You know, I think that's a different thing than being able to measure millimeters. I think the same thing can be said about vertical shear. You know, if you if you hold the patient's contralateral pelvis and load and counter load their leg, you you can see if there's substantial vertical uh, translation. Yeah. Um, but I think you protect yourself from really needing to know that in the highest energy ones if you fix them properly so they've got anterior ring fixation and ideally two points of posterior ring fixation and make them non-weight bearing yeah. treatments the same Mez, anything to add to that no i think i'm uh, you know i I'm going back to your first question regarding mobilization um I, so if i was going to take a 
uh, an LC1 fracture and stabilize it. Um, I would stabilize the back and the front. And, and once I've done that, I agree, I would let them wait there as tolerated. Great. All right. I'm going to move on. Um, we've, we've caught up a little bit. Uh, Paul, I'm going to go straight to you. And we're talking about acetabular fractures in older patients. Okay, great. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna step back a second. Sorry about that. Um, am I connected okay now? Um, so yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Pete. Um, thank you to uh, Team Ortho Hub. Um, am I sharing? Okay, can I just clarify? Yeah, I can see your, your screen nicely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so um, thanks for asking me tonight to come and speak about fragility fractures and in, in, um, uh, relating to the acetabulum. Um, as Pete mentioned, I'm a fellow consultant at the Royal London Hospital and um, I've been Pete's colleague for the last uh, 10 years in working and setting up our, our pelvic, uh, pelvic unit. Um, apologies. This is oh. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to come out for a second. Um, Uh, while we're waiting for uh, Paul to uh, sort of screen out, um, I've got um, I've got a question for you, Mez, uh, about uh, resus SI screws. Um, do you change your tactic uh, uh, when you're when you're doing those screws? Are you are you compromising your your imaging because uh, you're obviously you're in a bit of a hurry? Are you doing it slightly differently, or are you just you just are you winging it a bit, or do you feel like it's a safe thing to do? Yeah, you know, you've got to you've got to make that call, and um, and you if you've tried everything else, you've resuscitated the patient adequately, and they're still not responding. Um, it's it's either that or or losing the patient on the table. So I think um, it's difficult because I don't think it's for um, anyone and everyone. And I think if you're used to putting in sacroiliac joint screws. Um, then I think it is a calculated risk that you take. Um, I think it's important to, to just um, make people aware that, you know, yes, we are putting them in, um, in, in blind to some extent. I do have x-rays there. I think it's important to have um, another person there with you. So a registrar, a fellow, a fellow consultant, because you do want to try and reduce that pelvis and not just try and use your screws to, to reduce the whole pelvis because you may not be able to achieve that. So there are other maneuvers that you do. You keep the binder on lower down, you know, you will push um, on both of the GTs. Um, you will 
you will maybe even try and uh, push on the on the ileum to try and gain reduction. But yes, I think it's um, it's with X-ray present, but very few shots. Yeah, and you know, and and if I don't get them in the perfect position, as Paul said, you know, you saw my um, uh, telltale washer on the left side of my, of my case that I showed. Um, yeah. When I went back in to fix the front, you know, I, re I repositioned a screw. So uh, these are these are life saving screws. Um, you're not going to get perfect reduction. You're not going to get perfect um, uh, position of the screws. You're not aiming for that. Anesthetic people do report. <laughs> we have, I've had a number of cases where you put SI screws in in, in, a, in a fairly unstable patient, and they report an all a quite a dramatic change in the hemodynamics. Is that something you, you've 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 noticed? Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, you know, as soon as the screws um, go in and the pelvis is is squeezed up and stabilised. Um, uh, it's it's amazing. Yeah, I've had it twice now. The anaesthetist has said, "Well, what have you done? You know, something's changed." Because yeah. we're, we're we're actually um, winning. Um, we managed to get the blood pressure up a bit. So it is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Paul looks looks like you're up. That was a bit of a stress. Sorry about that, guys. I had a couple um, of cases, um, which I was just loading up in busy. case. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we'll edit it all out. Thank no one will ever know. Um, so thank you for covering, guys. Much, much appreciated. So take two. Um, fragility fractures uh, in uh, uh, in the area of the acetabulum. Um, so what we're talking about is fractures that are affecting the elderly population. So unlike the high energy injuries, this is really, we're talking about uh, falls from a standing height and the, res the resulting injury patterns that, that, that kind of follow on from that. Um, and uh, the fact that unlike the high energy fractures where the fractures, if you like, are quite clean in the osteoporotic bone, we're seeing a different pattern of fracture. Um, and Unlike the clean breaks, we're seeing deformity, deformity around the joint and deformity include, which, in, which includes the articular surface. Um, and this is, this is very difficult to deal with. Um, and this is what sets um, the, this, form, uh, this form of fracture apart from, uh, from the high energy, better quality fractures that we see in younger patients. And so we see this this different, difficult combination of femoral head damage, distorted anatomy with the femoral head pulled in through the pelvis and the impaction to, um, uh, to the cancellous bone around the joint. Um, and it was Anglin about, uh, about 20 odd years ago who described the gull sign. Um, and the gull sign is a, quite a classic finding in the osteoporotic fracture. Um, and what, what it represents is the, the femoral head being pulled medially and it's, a, it's, it's the deformity that, that involves that anterior column. And what, what, uh, what Anglin described it as is this harbinger of failure and doom. So in his series, this universally resulted in a, a very poor outcome. And this isn't something you see in the younger patients. Um, so Mata in um, documenting his um, his uh, highly impressive uh, case series. Um, he uh, did a did a case series where he, he was able to compare um, uh, his practice, if you like, in two different time frames. And what he noticed that, that over the uh, over a period of I think it was about 20, 24 years or so that that the first the first decade there was many many more uh, high energy fractures, a much lower propensity to. Um, to osteoporotic fractures, but this increased dramatically as time passed. And this was a paper that he published, um, you know, um, I think 15 years ago or so. Um, so the propensity for osteoporotic fractures is increasing. That pattern is continuing. Um, we're seeing the characterizations are different. We're seeing a much, much higher involvement in the quadrilateral plate and this concept of medialization of the, of the hip. Impaction into uh, the dome which is a result of failure in the anterior column, much higher instance of, of, of impaction throughout. And all of this is associated, is associated with a really poor outcome if what we're talking about is just fixing these fractures. 
Um, so what are the current management strategies in, in treating osteoporotic fractures? Well, much like LC1s, it's pretty disparate. Um, it's, there's many strategies. Um, evidence is in its infancy, as uh, Kelly was uh, describing earlier, and that's absolutely the same for elderly acetabular fractures. It's hugely variant on where you are, what surgeons, uh, what surgeons treating you, and what resources that surgeon has available to him and, and his experience. What about conservative management? So, I mean, conservative management is always, always an option. The reality in conservative management when we're talking about displaced fractures, so I think conservative management in an entirely undisplaced fracture and a compliant patient uh, may be a reasonable option, but conservative management in a patient that, um, that we are anticipating or hoping for a, for a good outcome uh, is not realistic and tend to, tend to do very badly. So I think it's really reserved for a non-ambulant um, patient who uh, is really not fit enough for any surgical intervention. Uh, so classically, your severely demented patient. Um, conservative management is not without, its, not without its hazards. So this was a patient that had a bilateral acetabular fractures. Um, the right side was managed conservatively. And this becomes very, very difficult to deal with. This woman did have multiple comorbidities. She was a kidney transplant patient, diabetic. Um, however, she was ambulant. Um, she uh, was independently mobile before her fall. Um, and to resolve this becomes a very, very complex surgery. And the patient has had a period of immobility. And, um, and this serial medial migration results in a very big acetabular defect, but it also begins to affect the femur, the greater trochanter is knocked off, and, and therefore you get a significant compromise in abductor function if you're, if you're going to then consider um, a reconstructive procedure, um, which in this case we did and had a, had a reasonable outcome and got her back to being mobile, but uh, it, this would have been much, much easier if, it, if this had been managed uh, more acutely. What about percutaneous fixation. Um, I think uh, this is um, a really reasonable option in a small select group of patients. Um, so uh, I think it's a really nice way of managing pain in the undisplaced fracture um, and permitting uh, early mobility. It also has a role in the patient that, that is uh, perhaps too sick for a bigger procedure and is not very mobile. Um, so the example that, that I have of this is a, is a patient who is just really not fit for a haircut. She was, uh, she was obese and she, was the, uh, she had advanced COPD. She was on home oxygen. Um, uh, the problem was that this injury pattern would not permit her to sit up. And so, it, it, so that even going bed to chair and for a simple transfer was, was a challenge for her. Um, so uh, we elect to treat this with a percutaneous technique. Um, we use uh, the star frame to, to distract the femoral head away from the acetabulum, um, which is the deforming force. And it is possible um, using a percutaneous technique to improve the overall alignment um, and to provide some form of stability. The reality of uh, this is identified already as a, as a pretty poor prognostic um, injury. So this probably isn't good enough for her to get up and mobilize with um, or weight bear, but for her that wasn't relevant. And so what it did permit was her to sit out of bed and have a much more congruent and less painful hip. Fixation alone. So we've identified that there's a, a number of um, radiographic and CT parameters that um, indicate it will be very challenging to get an anatomic reduction. I think if it's achievable, then fixation alone is a, is a very, very reasonable um, uh, treatment strategy and indeed the preferred treatment strategy uh, when it's achievable. The, the problem is that in a significant proportion of the acetabular fracture um, in the elderly population, because of all the deformity that arises around the joint, that is not achievable. So uh, if this is the result you achieve, then um, uh, fixation alone, I think, is, is the preferred management strategy. One might say, why don't we fix it and then return with, the, with a hip replacement if your fixation subsequently fails? And I think there is clearly a logic to this. Um, 
uh, a patient that that we had actually this came to us in 2011 and so this was a time when we hadn't really had, we hadn't really progressed into acute fix and replace and so this was uh, really treated along more traditional um, uh, treatment pathways um, so there was already some uh, some some damage to the chondral surfaces. He came to us a couple of weeks after his injury, um, and uh, there's there's medialization. There is incongruence of the hip. There is a femoral head that's likely to be damaged because it's been uh, in contact with uh, with 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 an exposed fracture. Um, and so initially, post-operative radiographs are actually actually quite favourable. And this is him only four months later. So at four months. Uh, we've already got quite strong evidence that this has failed. Clinically, he's doing uh, doing poorly. He's got pain. He's clearly de developing degenerative changes in his hip. And so the decision is made that we're going to uh, proceed with a, with a replacement. Now, the problem here is, is the system that we're working in, and we don't have um, always direct ac access to, to do these cases when they're away from the really the, the urgency of an acute fracture. So uh, from December... Through to, through to, um, uh, through to April. Four months later, the hip has really de deteriorated quite dramatically, um, and uh, and we'd still not managed to get this patient to theatre. In May, we managed to get his operation done, and um, so there's a six month period of him really doing extremely badly. So I, I think um, uh, there is, a, I think, a, a reasonable strategy to 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 be to do a trial of fixation, but I think it's important to monitor these patients carefully and it's certainly preferable to access salvage surgery really early, uh, as early as possible because um, large delays, I think, uh, significantly um, make, they make the, the surgery so much more challenging, more challenging than it truly needs to be. Um, so the concept of fix and replace has been gaining hugely in popularity. It's something that's been uh, really taken off, I think, over the last um, seven or eight years. Um, and um, we've touched already on, on some of the parameters that will, will guide us towards this being a preferred management strategy. So acetabular impaction, femoral head damage, medialization of the femoral head and, the, and significant posterior wall involvement. Um, the evidence on guiding us which way to manage this fracture group is um, is is of poor quality. Um, it's essentially a large, the multiple series, uh, fairly small case series. Um, and uh, what they highlight is that when, uh, when we're, we're gathering PROMS type data, the patients seem to do better than the fixation group. Um, the procedure is tolerated, so, uh, so the patients are are, are in fact able to uh, to sustain what's which is was pretty extensive surgery. Um, uh, the complication rate is higher than primary arthroplasty, uh, as we'd as we'd expect, and probably closer to a, to a revision hip replacement type of scenario. Um, more recent case studies case studies are are, are being produced fairly regularly, um, and there's more uh, I guess further evidence that. Um, that, that, that it permits earlier mobilization and earlier return to function and, um, and, and more favorable clinical results. Um, but really what we don't have is, is any, any strong evidence to guide us one way or another. Um, uh, the reoperation rate from fixation alone is, is very high. So the appeal of fix and replace is that you're doing it in a single, a single sitting, whether it's a staged or, 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 or um, or in a single sitting is is um, is considered to be one episode, if you like, um, and there's clear benefits to early mobilisation. So the technique, the technique that um, that we use in our institution has been evolving, and so this is a, a presentation of of what where we started with this and some of the principles that we adhered to to uh, which delivered uh, fairly consistent results. Um, so. Our technique is, is a, has a tendency to do it as a stage procedure, particularly if we're uh, when the, when the anterior column or the medialization um, through a stop approach is being addressed. I, we t I tend to do this through a stage procedure. Still, the stop approach has been invaluable in, in being able to access the medial 
uh, quadrilateral plate and, and buttress that back um, fairly minimally invasively. Correct the overall anatomy, so we're able to address the medialization. The star frame is really useful uh, surgical technique to remove the femoral head as a deforming force. Um, and uh, the theory is that we're, we're, we're returning as much skeletal stability to the, the pelvis and acetabular zone as possible. Um, so a hip that's clearly going to struggle, huge femoral head defect, significant medialization, um, a push-pull technique to restore the overall anatomy, achieve a congruent hip again um, through a stopper approach, a medial buttress plate, which works very, very effectively. Um, a second anterior column plate, followed by the next procedure, which is to fix the posterior column and proceed with a hip replacement. Um, and you can see we're adhering to maximal fixation. Um, so the principles in my arthroplasty are, are about trying to restore the hip center, essentially, put it as close to where it's anatomically normal as you can achieve, because we know hips do much better there. Um, the, we're using revision sort of principles in that we're able to position our components to maximize bone contact, um, maximal fixation, so multiple screws, and it's a posterior column that I'm utilizing to hang this implant from. Um, and I'm, I, I like to use uh, dual mobility to, to facilitate um, uh, the overall stability of the joint afterwards. Um, and I am a big advocate of using um, modularity in this system because I think it, it gives you a lot, of, uh, a lot of power in optimizing the orientation of your cup to the host bone, yet um, uh, maintaining a, a good or orientation to deliver stability. These are generally an osteoporotic patient group, and so uh, it tends to be used, used in conjunction with a cemented femoral stem. Uh, so it's revision hip components. It's not typically a primary arthroplasty um, uh, with regards to a, a choice of implant. So our early case series, this is the first four years of, of doing fix and replace. So this is up to about uh, 2015. And so just to, to confirm to, uh, really, really ourselves that this was a, a, a viable option and to assess um, uh, uh, the, the cohort of patients that we're treating. Um, the majority are falls from standing height, so they fit with uh, the, the stereotype that we're expecting. Um, an interesting subgroup was the iatrogenic fractures. So these are patients that have come for a primary hip arthroplasty and there's been a complication intraoperatively and they've, uh, they've sustained an acetabular fracture um, and been, have been transferred over to our unit. Um, that cohort has a very, very much higher complication rate. Um, so that's where we tend to see infections. Um, and uh, so that was, that was an interesting early finding. And in fact, that, that continues to, to, to be a, a feature that I see in my practice. So we confirmed that this is tolerated. Um, our two deep infections came with iatrogenic fracture subgroup. Um, we had one uh, case where we lost position and we had one early dislocation, which was treated with a closed reduction. The, the, our case of lost position was when we decided not to stick with to the principles that we've that we'd outlined. So we went for a very much more minimal fixation option. And as soon as that patient began to mobilize and weight bear, um, we lost fixation very early and uh, I revised it um, to what you can see below and the patient went on to do uh, absolutely fine. So just to take you through a few case examples. Um, so uh, this gentleman is a highly commutated fracture with medialization impaction as, as we've uh, already defined. I've gone for maximal fixation. It was, uh, it was combined with a, a a pelvic ring injury. And at three months, we've got him walking in clinic, not comparable to how it would yeah. done. This was simply a, um, a fixation group. 72 year old lady with uh, an injury pattern which is predominantly affecting the posterior wall. Um, and so this is done all from the back and as a single stage procedure. Um, and again, the great benefit is 
Okay, so eight this weeks is post surgery nine weeks after without any support, a pretty balanced gait pattern. Um, and the okay, wait a minute, I'll, I'm back on the video, so show me that again. But, but show me your exercises, okay? That's great. And then I. Uh, an 82 year old fall from a ladder, so a, a pretty active uh, uh, guy, but with some uh, significant medical history. Um, I just wanted to show you this CT scan. So it's when we, when we see the it's, it's affecting both columns. And actually, if I just show you a snapshot of the axial view, you can see that impaction um, into the uh, into the, the posterior column, which is which is entirely inaccessible through a, a through a um, uh, through an anterior approach with regards to how one can fix this. Um, so this fracture would would expect to do extremely badly. Um, and fix and replace really uh, worked as a very nice option for him. Um, so this is at four weeks. Start to walk. Yep, yeah, you can start doing that. Great. Final case to share. So another subgroup that um, that, that we've come across is the, is the seizure patient group. So this, the seizure patients that are, are quite often present with bilateral acetabular fractures. This particular one is, is perhaps only one of two that I have that's a unilateral injury. They nearly always have, uh, in fact, they universally have impaction. And um, this guy was uh, fairly young um, and um, and actually functioning fairly well. So. Despite him being 57 years old, this was treated as, an, uh, as, a, as a fix and replace um, in, uh, for him, a staged manner. So it looks like we've got a reasonable reduction, but actually you can see the defect is still lying within the dome. And so I'm expecting that if we um, do not address this early, it's likely to go on to failure. Um, so that's what so, we did. Okay, if you want to walk towards me, that's great. And a couple of months back, we got him walking with, with a near normal gait pattern. Um, so in summary, I'm, I would, I'd be a, I'm a strong proponent of acute total hip replacement in association with uh, osteoporotic fractures when we're seeing the indicators of, of, of poor prognosis. So dome comminution, femoral head impaction, quad medialization, posterior column and wall displacement and delayed surgery. Adhering to principles of maximal skeletal stability, restoration of anatomy, um, beware of the medialization. We want to restore that uh, center of rotation to where it's meant to be. The use of uh, revision components, um, uh, and together I think this, this can deliver actually uh, really very good results. So in summary, all options are open for osteoporotic fractures. It's a very disparate group of patients to treat. This is still I think a very very hard decision maker I think the extremes uh, of presentation are relatively easy so the the active patient um, uh, is is perfect for fix and replace if you have uh, poor prognostic signs on radiographs if you can get an anatomic reduction then I, I think ORF alone is is, is very reasonable um, and conservative or percutaneous fixation uh, in, in my view is for the undisplaced fracture or for patients that are simply not fit enough for uh, more extensive surgery. Thank you very much. Hey mate, great job. Sorry, my computer just kept packed up. Um, <laughs> so Kelly, what um, uh, what uh, in the what what are you guys doing for these? Because you you uh, you you run like a trauma team and you have your arthroplasty guys as a separate crew. Mm -hmm. What's the liaison? That's right, yeah. yeah, so good question. Well, first thing I'll say is um, I'm I'm obviously very. Uh, biased by my own training and my own experience, but the evidence for hip survival and percutaneous treatment is similar to the evidence for hip survival and traditional open approaches. 
So what groups can be adequately treated with that, I think is a point of some contention. So I still do a lot of percutaneous treatment, especially in older patients with secondary congruence um, and without uh, significant marginal impaction. We have been probably a little later to the game with fix and replace than some for the reason you said, it's you know pulling the group that's largely doing only elective surgery out at the arthroplasty hospital and not kind of getting into the weeds of call and emergency care often. Um, so getting them to buy in um, has taken some time, but we're, we're in a real uptick with this uh, like everybody else. Um, so we're treating many hyper elderly patients with significant injuries with cones a year. We did four last year. Um, and then traditional fix and replace we're doing more and more of as well. There is a, a pending RCT in Canada as well called the Gator Trial, which we're involved with. Great. Uh, Mez, tell me about cones. Uh, are, we, are cones still on the market or are, are they, um, uh, cause I, I, I thought there were some, some problems with the manufacturing of those. Yeah, so, um, you know, we, we do a few cones and have done quite a few cones. Um, and so the cone that was our go-to cone to start off with was the Stanmore cone. Um, and this, you, you had a hydroxy appetite, um, cement less version and uh, um, uh, a polished uh, stem, uh, uh, which you could cement. Um, and so that is not um, available as it was um, last year or the year before. And the reason for that is mainly the CE, mark, uh, CE marking on that. Um, but there are other cones available. So um, other companies um, uh, do do a modular cementless um, cone prosthesis um, with dual mobility bearings, et cetera. So, so uh, yeah, there are lots of, lots of different types of cone prosthesis available. I think um, you've got to get your indications right. And I, um, I'm glad to hear that, you know, Kelly says that they've done four, but they're still doing some um, open reduction internal fixations and replacements as well, because I think there's no comeback after a, a cone prosthesis. So I think if, you, if you're thinking about some patients who are 50, 60, 70, um, and you're thinking about doing a, a, a replacement, an early replacement, then I think a, a fix and replace is a very good option for those. I think if you've got the 80-year-olds, 85-year-olds, 90-year-olds, um, they're the ones um, uh, that would benefit from a, from a cone prosthesis. So a, a relatively quick operation, one approach, get them weight bearing. Paul, back to you a second. Um, on the, so you, you were talking about doing a front and back approach, but of course, arthroplasty kit has, has really come on since then. And now you can do pretty much everything from the back if you want to, in a, you know, with, with all the revision components. Why bother going from the front when you can do it all from the back? Why do two stages when one will do? So I think that's been the evolution that I kind of um, uh, mentioned in passing in my talk. So I think when we started off doing this, my thoughts were that we're really wanting to restore as much skeletal stability as possible and put as close to, uh, the focus was all about restoring anatomy as accurately as possible. Um, and so we were pretty conservative to begin with. And uh, it, uh, and we are more and more and more ambitious, I guess, with what we're doing as a single stage from the back. Um, I still have some reservation about doing some cases entirely from the back. I think when we've got segmental anterior column loss um, and a, a lot of displacement, it's asking um, it's asking a lot of uh, a lot of your components to to do it all from the back. When we have the ability to go from the front. That's, that actually we know is quite well tolerated and um, restore that anatomy, restore the bone contact. And um, I think um, I still have some hesitation for the, for the more complex end of the spectrum. For sure, the simpler end, um, small anterior uh, column defects, we're, we're doing them all from the, front, all from the back as a, single, as a single operation. Great. Uh, Mezzi, is, is that your experience as well? Uh, yeah, I, I agree. So we've, we've been um, through a whole circle of things. So um, yes, we uh, 
Tony Ward um, came back after his fellowship in, in Pittsburgh and set up the unit with us. Um, uh, and he was with Dana Mears, um, who used to do them all through um, the poster approach um, and, and firing an anterior column screw. But, you know, we had um, uh, slightly different implants than what we have available now. Those patients were managed touch on non weight bearing for a period of time and then partial weight bearing for a period of time. And so um, uh, the demands of the patients have changed. Um, implants have changed. Um, and I think the whole, the whole point of doing this operation in the older person is to, is to get them to weight bear. And if you've done an operation just through one approach, but you're still not going to let them weight bear, then I think that's a problem. So I think doing a, um, an anterior approach um, to gain stability of that column um, and, and reduction of that column if it's required, and then doing a subsequent posterior approach and allowing them to weight bear after the operation um, is far more beneficial. Yeah. Uh, Kelly, what is the role for percutaneous fixation in this, in this age group? So, I mean, I still think there's a big role. The first thing I'll say about percutaneous surgery is that um, as a staged procedure, you know, it does prevent that medialization that you see in the non-surgically treated patients. And Paul had some great x-rays of patients that had significant late medialization. So it does prevent that. Um, so I use a lot of percutaneous surgery in minimally displaced or undisplaced injuries in young people. And in older patients, um, I do it in patients that are lacking those hallmarks of early failure. So uh, posterior column impaction, goal sign, you know, dislocate medial dislocation and other uh, significant markers of poor outcome regardless of treatment. But ABCs, anterior column, posterior hemitransverse in the 70-year-old population, still 60 to 70, still pretty routinely treating those percutaneously. Yeah. Um, cement versus non-cement, Paul? Um, so again, evolution of practice. We've, we've got become pretty obsessed in the UK um, with, uh, it becomes quite controversial to not cement um, above the age of 70. Um, so uh, if we're talking on the femoral side, that's, um, that's pretty much standard practice. And especially this patient group, when they're coming with an osteoporotic fracture, one has to think that um, uh, cement is meant for osteoporotic patients. Um, so my practice has moved from being somebody who actually didn't really cement ever uh, to, to cementing more often than not, um, uh, certainly in this patient group, pretty much always. Mayor, is there anything to add to that? No, I think um, cementing the stem is is routine for me in this in this cohort. But I think the cement less cups um, and the revision type cups um, uh, are fantastic um, uh, to gain primary stability. And are you buying uh, Paul's point about there's still being some benefit about going front and back, or are you tending to do things more and more? Uh, with an uber arthroplasty rather than going and fixing the front first? Oh, no, no, no. Um, as I said, so our, our younger patients, and I'm, I'm saying younger up to sort of 75 or so, um, that would qualify for a, a fix and replace, get a dual approach. Yeah. It's, it's the ones who are over 75, 80, 85-year-olds who will get a single approach and probably a cone I think, uh, Kelly, I'm, I'm not asking you this question because I think you're an expert in it, but I've, we've got to ask someone this question. Is there okay. any role for non-operative treatment? Who gets non-op in, in your experience? Oh, patients that are unfit for surgery, I would say. You know, patients yeah. where even in a, a femoral neck fracture that there would be a question about their suitability for surgery. Um, they get non-surgical treatment and then the completely undisplaced in the elderly patients, like the over 75 yeah. patients. Yeah. Last question. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll be interested to hear what you guys say about this is about ACE fit. So ACE fit was the British, uh, it, was, it was just a feasibility trial looking at non-op versus fix and replace versus ORIF. Um, and uh, that, that was that they, they recruited and that's now closed and we're now looking at the second phase which will be ace fit two 
And my question to each of you or to whoever who wants to take it is, what does that experiment look like? What should the trial look like to, to, to answer this question? Because I think, I think it's a really tough trial to, 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 to organize. I think the difficulty with um, this type of study where the two treatment arms are so difficult or are so different, I mean, is you would inherently bias the study by the outcome measure you choose. So if you're making those that are treated with fix and replace, um, and those in the other arms not immediate weight bearing which is what they're planning in the canadian study then your outcome is about early you know six week three month six month functional and it's going to be strongly biased late those patients are going to be functioning better at that stage your outcome is biased that one where you expect replace group the potential issue being need of revision and, uh, and other problems down the road but your outcome measure misses i just lost kelly uh i'm not sure that's my my uh internet or yours but uh Mez, anything to add on what what the experiment should look like yeah i think it's difficult isn't it i think um um equipoise is a is a real um potential problem um, with this group of patients because so what we, we found is that we uh, uh, had very few patients who we as a group of surgeons and there were four of us um, that hand on our heart said that actually this patient um, would be happy to randomize to either of the three arms so non-op um, surgical fixation or fixation and replacement. And so that um, is a difficulty. And I think that probably differs between units as well. Um, and I think that's gonna be, so there are, there are gonna be some units that recruit lots and some recruit and some that recruit very few. And I think that's because of equipoise and um, experience, but also, um, uh, fundamental thoughts on how they want to manage fractures. So I think it's going to be very difficult. Yeah, uh, I'm aware that we all need to wrap this up. But uh, Paul, last word to you. Uh, uh, what, what 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 does the experiment look like in your in your eyes? Well, I think it's it's so frustrating because it's so kind of incredibly important. Um, and I think because we we, we definitely need guidance. Um, I think there's there's clarity in what we need to do in the extreme. So the the, the moribund patient we don't operate on, the highly functioning individual. We, we need to pull out other stops and restore anatomy, but there's a massive group in the middle and that's where the recruitment arm is just going to really, really struggle. Um, and I, I don't know the answer to it. Um, I think three choices is probably too much. Um, and uh, I think it needs to be a straightforward fix versus fix and replace. Um, uh, I, in my personal opinion, I'm always very uncomfortable with, with the thought of conservative management and, and this in any patient group where we, where I, I feel we've moved on yeah. so far from that. Um, but even the treatment arms, how is that going to look in different centers? They're going to be so, so different. And you can't, you, you can't force that onto a center because there's so much variation in experience, training. And, uh, uh, and so it, it, it's a really, really frustrating one because it's so important and very, very difficult to, to, to deliver on, I think. And if we don't get it quite right, people just won't recruit. Um, yeah. So, uh, and then it's, a, then it's a whole lot of energy and, and we're no further forward. Yeah. Uh, Kelly, you got cut off, so I, I'll give the last word to you. Uh, anything to add to that? So I would, ag I would agree with that, that the non-op study or non-op arm of that trial is going to really impede recruitment. I think that would be the case here too. The Canadian study looks at ORAF versus fix and replace. Um, but still, I think there's going to be issues with, with bias uh, introduced with the outcome measure. Yeah. So I think the study will go forward. I think there's a lot of appetite for it. It's not going to answer every question uh, related to this, including what the long-term impacts of fix and replace are as far as cost to the system and reoperation and so on. Um, but we'll be better than the information we have now for sure. Yeah, great. All right, awesome. Well, thanks so much, guys. Uh, are you seeing my screen being shared just there? No. Nope. Was that a no? 
That's a no, yeah, same black screen that we had before. Okay, all right, not to worry. Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna summarize this one uh, just, just uh, straight up. So we've had three great talks today. Apologies for the sticky issues um, um, around um, some of the tech, but anyway, resuscitation. Mez gave us a nice ABC on that. I think if there's one take home message on resuscitation is damage control resuscitation is, is the current, current term or hemostatic resuscitation, emphasizing, yes, you're restoring volume, but it's with, with native blood. It's, it's not quite one to one to one because you've got uh, the, the front, the first bits are front loaded with FFP and blood, and then you start giving cryo and, and platelets down the, down the line. The thing about damage control resuscitation of all the stuff we've talked about today it is actually the stuff that is is best evidenced overall. Uh, you know, you've got uh, the stuff from Afghanistan and um, the war conflicts in Iraq, and then you're coming to the crash two start studies. And now we've got the cryostat study uh, looking at bringing cryo precipitate early into the into the um, into the resus arena. So there is a lot of evidence around resuscitation. From the pelvic side, actually DCR, damage control resuscitation, does work in the vast majority of cases. If you do that well, the number of patients going through to needing intensive, you know, an individual radiology or requiring uh, uh, pelvic packing is very, very small. You know, it's you know, 5% of these unstable ones. So, uh, you know, doing DCR well is, is at the heart of every, every center. Uh, Kelly gave us a great talk on, um, on LC1s, my God, it's a nightmare because uh, you know uh, every, everyone's doing something slightly different, and it's a little bit embarrassing actually because uh, you know when you're set up at the trauma meeting and you say, "Well, we could fix this patient, we don't, or we couldn't," we, we you know, it's it's. Uh, but the the thing about LC1 fractures is that the thing that unites them all is that they are bone is broken, but the ligaments, or at least some of the ligaments, are intact. And so, yes, you can even load them and they will move. And the really bad ones, you can squeeze them and they will move across, they will adduct. But if it's a proper LC1, it won't vertically displace. And that's why some people advocate, you can treat the whole lot, the whole lot non-operatively. But because they do this, some authors say, well, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna do an EUA. I wanna, I wanna see how wobbly it is and then go ahead and treat it. And there is massive controversy in, um, uh, in, in LC1s. Um, uh, I, 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 Kelly, I loved your summary at the end, basically saying, I look at the fracture characteristics and there are certain fracture characteristics which make it make you worry that it's gonna be a bit more unstable. And that's things like a, a through and through, you know, a, a, a complete sacral fracture, bilateral ramus <laughs> fractures, more comminution, et cetera. Uh, and then you can start looking at the patient and say, well, have they got extra injuries? That leans me more towards fixation. Uh, and are they struggling to mobilize? In which case that pushes you towards fixation. So I think doing that unthinkable thing of actually like, you know, considering the patient as a whole rather than just as a, as a, as a fracture is the way to go with LC1s. Uh, Paul, lovely, ni nice, nice description of, you know, the controversy around as a, a geriatric acetabular fractures, they they are a really difficult group for decision making, and we're still not quite there. We're desperately in need of a randomized controlled trial, but what the arms look like is difficult because when you're designing any randomized controlled trial, yes, you've got to get the, the question right, and yes, you've got to get your measure your outcome measures right, but the other thing you've got to get is you've got to get buy-in from all the surgeons doing the, in, in the trial. So people have to agree and go, yes, I'll randomize to that. And putting non-operative into that, that, that algorithm will cut out a lot of people. And I think that's about my summary of the session. Guys, thank you so much for coming in. And it's been, uh, it's been great. Uh, Mez, really grateful. Kelly, thank you very much. Paul, thanks for giving up your time, guys. Really grateful. Cheers.